again, good morning. Welcome to Central Baptist Paragold Campus, whether in person or online. We are excited you are with us. And I want to invite you, if you have a Bible, to turn with me to the book of Acts chapter 2. Uh, We're in this third week now of Build His Church. We've been looking at what has happened after Jesus died and resurrected with those people who are following Him over the last couple of weeks. And now we're in week three of what happens after 3,000 people get saved. But as you're turning there, and if you don't have a Bible, that's totally fine. The passage will be here on the screen, and it's also there in your saying the no also. But as you're getting there or opening up your Bible app, Uh, I want to share with you a statement that I have heard often. Matter of fact, I have probably heard it in every season of my Christian life. And it's a statement more than likely that, that you guys have heard as well. You've heard someone say this. Maybe you've even said it yourself. But here's the statement. The statement goes something like this. I can have a relationship with Jesus and not be a part of a church. I can grow in my relationship with Jesus and I don't need a church to help me do that. And, and I want to I break that statement down because there's a lot of different reasons why certain people will say that. But I want to break it down. On the one hand, that statement is true. Matter of fact, Romans 1 tells us that God's creation, it causes all humanity to worship. You know, some of you love sitting in a, in a deer stand or, or, or duck hunting or fishing. Some of you love to, uh, uh, you, maybe you're like me and you like getting out in the mountains somewhere. Or you like being on a river or you love being at the lake. And those moments where you're there, you just feel the presence of God that you have this really powerful moment with Jesus while you're sitting on a pontoon boat by yourself or with your family out in the middle of Norfolk Lake. And that's totally fine. That is true to a certain extent that even when you look into the faces of your children when they're acting right, you can just feel the presence and the goodness of of God. When you see His creation, you don't have to be in a church service 24-7 to have a relationship with Jesus. So on the one hand, that statement is true. But on the other hand, that statement is false. Here's what I mean by that. Oftentimes when people make that statement, it's people who have concluded that they want nothing to do with the church. And a lot of times, let's just be honest, a lot of times that's rooted in a hurt. That they've been hurt by the church. Maybe they had a bad pastor that did something awful within the church. Maybe they had a big church split or maybe they went, saw a lot of business meetings that just went bad often. And people, or maybe they saw a lot of hypocrites, people who'd be in the church and they were you know, kind of in leadership in the church, but then out in the community, they were totally different people. And so those people then concluded, I don't need the church to have a relationship with Jesus. And for those people and for that trajectory with that statement, that's false. Matter of fact, you do need the church to grow in your relationship with Jesus. That while those times on the lake or in the deer sand or in the mountains are good, they are not a supplement for the local church. You and I, to grow in our relationship with Jesus and for Jesus to continue to build his kingdom, we must choose to be devoted, committed to a church, a local church. And you may be like, well, Blake, that's just your opinion. That's just what you think about it. I I don't feel that way. Well, that's fine how you feel, but that's not my opinion. This morning, we're gonna see from God's word what Jesus does after his resurrection to change the world. Because what we see in this passage is not, hey, Just go up to the mountains every now and then. Or hey, make sure you make it to the lake and I'll be there with you. Or hey, just kind of do whatever you want to do and throw up a prayer every now and then and it'll be all good. We'll change the world, you and me. No, when Jesus decides to change the world, when he resurrects from the grave, he does something very specific that here's the deal, will truly change your life if you let it. 
that if you allow and you commit yourself to these things that we're seeing in this passage of Scripture, it will change your life. So this morning we're going to look at this passage of Scripture and see how groups and gathering have any impact on our spiritual growth and also on the kingdom of God. So we're going to start in verse 42, but begin, or before we begin, just so that we're all on the same page, here's what's just happened. Jesus, a few weeks ago in this story, has resurrected from the grave. Peter and the apostles and a small group of the, the, church, the, the, the Christ followers at the time were gathered together. Jesus ascends back to heaven. He sends the Holy Spirit to them. And Peter gets up and preaches in front of thousands of Jews. And in that moment when he preaches, many, the scripture tells us 3,000 people get saved and get baptized. They publicly declare what Christ has done in their lives. It's a crazy, cool moment. But how do you take that moment and catalyze it into a movement? Here's what Jesus does. Here's what he wants for those who have been saved and baptized in the following passages. Beginning in verse 42, let's read together. They, being those people who have just come to Jesus, who've just been saved, the first Christians, if you want to use that word, in Scripture. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions, and they were sharing them with all, as any might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Let's pray together this morning as we dive into how this story can change our lives. Let's pray. Father, as I prayed earlier today, I pray again that I am worthless and incapable of anything spiritual in the lives of other people apart from you. So Father, I pray this morning that your spirit would speak through your word and that, God, you would change people's lives. Lord, some this morning would be saved. God, we pray in the name of Jesus. We plead for it, for lost souls to be saved today, to come to know Christ. And Father, for those who do know Christ, I pray that they, every one of us, myself included, would leave here with such a tender and devoted love to you, and to your church. God, I pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Two ways we're going to see this morning that Christ builds his church and how that impacts you. And the first is this. Jesus builds his church through small groups. Jesus builds his church through small groups. So it starts off this passage again. Dive back with me in verse 42. They were continually devoting themselves to a few things. Who were they? They were were these converts who had just come to know Christ. And they went from this massive gathering of of more than 3,000 people to now they were gathered, and Scripture tells us here in just a moment, house to house. They went from huge corporate gathering where 3,000 people get saved to small groups. Matter of fact, I tell people all the time in our starting point class, and I probably told you this before if you've been with us long enough, That when Jesus wanted to change the world, he did not start a large gathering. He started a small group. That's what Jesus did. Matter of fact, whenever the group got too big, you remember what Jesus would do? Massive crowds would start following Jesus. And then he'd come in and say, okay, everybody, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood if you want any part in me. And then a whole group of people said, yeah, we out. We're gone. Oh, then, then, then when the crowd got too big, he would say stuff like, if you don't die to yourself, take up your cross and follow me, you can never be my disciples. A whole other group of people left. 
He wasn't about the major crowds. Now, he loves big churches. Matter of fact, the first one was a mega church. But that mega church got really small really fast. And they were committed to or devoted to something, a few things that we ourselves are to be devoted to. Like this passage is not something for us. Here's the deal. I think sometimes we disconnect ourselves from the Bible completely. And we just like to, we like it to stay here, but we don't want it to go here. We like it to, oh, that was a good thing to learn or to know, but it doesn't impact here. It doesn't impact our hands, our heart. But this passage of scripture was given to us, not only so that we can know what the first church was doing, but also so we as the church can keep doing it. So that we can continue what they were doing. So here's what they were devoted to. Number one, they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. Apostles were the 11 disciples that had face-to-face interaction with Jesus. That's who the apostles were. And you know what they were teaching? This, the Word of God. Now, not specifically all of the New Testament because they didn't have it all, but they were teaching Old Testament scriptures, specifically the ones that addressed or pointed to Christ. So these disciples were coming together, this church was coming together, small groups coming together, and they were devoting themselves to, more simply, God's Word. That's why when we gather together, you're not going to sit here and hear 40 minutes of my opinion. When we gather in small groups, you're not going to sit there and be like, well, what do you think about it? I don't know. What do you think about it? I don't know. What do you think about it? No, the centerpiece of our time together is the word of God. They were devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. I'm going to clump fellowship and the breaking of bread together. They, that first early church, they were committed to God's word and they were committed to coming together and eating. Eating. Now specifically it talks here about the Lord's Supper that they were committed to do. But also it goes on a little further and talks about they were committed to eating. And all the traditional Southern Baptists in the house said, Amen. Amen. That's right. I love that. Matter of fact, eating is addressed twice in this passage. It's the only idea that's addressed twice in this passage. What does that tell us? It tells us that God wants us to come together and eat together, spend time together, laugh together over meals. Have you ever thought about this? That a table, a table, just a simple table is one of the most powerful things on the planet. Because think about what happens at a table. You enjoy good food. You pray together. You laugh together. You discuss your family together. You discuss the future together. You discuss your past together. You recline together. Man, a table is a powerful tool. Matter of fact, Jesus, I heard a sermon this last week where the pastor connected all of these different times where Jesus was teaching and people were eating. Like for Jesus, it was like, hey, we're gonna worship God and we're also gonna worship God through food, through eating. And so they were committed to that. They were committed to doing life together and eating food together and also to prayer. They were committed to praying together. Do you know? As a matter of fact, you know it, but do you believe that your prayer life has more power than my preaching? Do you believe that? I do. I want to spend more time in prayer throughout the week. Praying, just praying on my knees, literally in a closet in my house. I want to spend more time each week in that space than up here. Because if I spend more minutes of my day speaking and preaching to you than I have prayed, then I've failed you. I have failed you. Because the last thing you need is a short, receding hairline dude talk about God when he doesn't spend time with him that whole week. They were committed to prayer. Are you committed to prayer the same way they were? Do you really believe prayer prayer works? That God works through it? Man, he does. He does. And the fourth thing they were committed to, God's word, eating, prayer, and giving. Look with me in verse 45. And they began selling their property and their possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might had need. God's word eating, fellowship, prayer, and giving. You know, when we, when we looked at and we were working through the starting point material and we talked about like, what do we want our church to be and who do we want our church to live for? We didn't sit around the table and think, well, I don't know, what do you think? I don't know, I read this book the other day or I don't know, I thought about this or oh, this church is doing this, that sounds like a good idea. Do you know what we went to? Right here. 
When, 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 when I encourage our people to give, when we, when we say, hey, be a giver, when I personally tithe, I know that my tithing, my giving, it blesses everyone in the house, and it blesses the Lord, and it blesses me. Because every time I do it, it reminds me, this world is not my home. What I have has been given to me from God. It is not mine to keep. And you may be like, well, no, it is yours to keep. How many people go into eternity with a wallet? Nobody. This is what the early church was doing. And if the church today gets away from these things, from focusing on God's word and focusing on each other and focusing on prayer, devoted to prayer, and also being devoted to giving, then we are not being the church that he's called us to be. And that happened through small groups. That's where it was taking place, in small groups. Listen, I want to show you guys a quick video so that you don't just hear from me of how this right here can change your life. I want you to hear from people in our church whose life groups have changed their lives. You guys check this video out real quick. So exactly what it sounds like, a life group for us is people that we do life with. These aren't just people that we see once a week or talk to once a week. These are people that we talk to throughout the week. We have conversations, we send prayer requests, our kids play together, we have play dates. Like they are people that we're literally walking through life with. These are our friends. It's the refresher that I need. We have shared with each other our struggles and our trials. We all come to church looking like we've all got it together and none of us do. And so the uh, Lord has opened my eyes to the, the trials and the fears and the, and the heartache that other people have. He's really opened my eyes to that because it's, if you're not in a life group, you're just staying in your little circle and you don't uh, get exposed to that. So I think for me personally, it's made me less judgmental and more compassionate and more loving, I hope. Well, life group is important to me because it helps me continue my walk with Christ throughout the week. Um, he's really helped me as far as my devotion um, with reading my Bible. I get my scripture that I need every morning. Uh, it's important for me to have uh, more time with Christian fellowship and Christian friends and family, brothers and sisters uh, throughout the week rather than just on Sunday. So it's important for me to have that and uh, to help me with my growth in Christ. It has meant a new friendships. I've met um, people from all ages, believers from all ages, and all walks of life that I never would have met otherwise. We've uh, fellowshiped together, um, prayed together, praised together, and I have made um, eternal long friends. Relationships are so important, and the people we surround ourselves with can either build us up or they can tear us down and that's exactly what we do is build people up so our life group the relationships that we have with one another are so important because as we go through difficult times and we know that we're going to we know that we're going to face difficult seasons our life group is exactly that we speak life into one another's situations we pray over one another we speak scripture into each other's lives we study scripture together and it's amazing to see what God can do through your life by surrounding yourself by other people who are praying and seeking the Lord and wanting to do life together in that way. I think a lot of people are scared of big churches, but that's where a life group really comes into play. Because if you have your life groups, that church doesn't seem so big when you start having good conversations with people that are, um, you know, they welcome you with open arms and everything like that. It's, it's a place that you don't feel judged. So. Um, if anybody's hesitant about a life group, definitely give it a shot because it's gonna change you in more ways than one. You know, our life group is like a small family inside of a bigger family. When you get together with other believers and you share food, good food, and you share laughter and joy, but then you also open up and get vulnerable and let people know what you're struggling with, what you need prayer for, your trials. I think when we get together like that and we look at God's Word and see what His Word says for those situations and we seek His peace, then I think that increases our faith 
it increases our peace and our joy. And if that's increasing, then our love for others is going to increase. And that's what it's all about. Jesus wants us to love others the way he loves us. Yeah, absolutely. We can celebrate that. Listen, Jesus wants to grow his church and he wants to grow your life through small groups. There's, there's, there's no other way around it. Like, well, I can, I can do this or I can do that. But no, the precedent is set. This is how you grow. Matter of fact, Pastor Chuck brought this up, so I'm stealing his thunder, but I'm giving him credit for it. You know, God himself is a small group. He is community. He is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. One and three, three and one. I can't fully explain it. But God himself is in community with himself. Why would he not expect us also to be that same type of people? He has created us for each other. And I love what, what, um, what Brandon said there. Like, it's like a smaller family, part of a bigger family. I always think of a small group like a family reunion. So <clears throat> this is the family reunion. And you know when you come together in a family reunion, you don't know everybody. It's like, oh, there's crazy Uncle Bob. I'm not going to see him today, you know. Or, oh, there's that person. You know, you don't know them that well, but you love them all. They're in the family, and all y'all wearing the same T-shirt, you know. It's all, yeah, everybody's together. Everybody's eating, you know, potato salad. I don't understand family reunions. Everybody brings 18 different forms of potato salad, whatever. Anyway, some of y'all brought potato salad to your family reunion this summer, and you're like, I'm offended. I am offended. I'm just kidding. But Sunday morning's like the family reunion. But then you go back and, and you have your family, like your immediate family, the people that you really know, that you really do life with, that you know their, their, their victories and you know their mess, and you are choosing to love and to live with them. That's your small group. This is a family reunion, but a small group is where you really do life with people. So the first way that God builds his church is through small groups. But the second way and the last way that we're going to see is this morning. From this passage, Jesus builds his church through corporate gatherings. Jesus builds his church through large corporate gatherings. You may be like, well, what is that? That's this. This, what we're doing here and now. He is wanting to build your life, build your spiritual life, and also build his church by what we're doing right here. Let's look back at this passage of scripture to see how we see that. And so it says, verse 46 day by day, continuing with one mind. So they were all together, this big group of people that had one mind, they had one vision, one purpose. And here's what they were doing. They were in with one mind in the temple. And I want to pause right there. That is the bigger place where they met. So all these Christians that were spread out over all these homes throughout the week, then they would come together in this temple to worship. To see each other, to celebrate. It tells us here what they're doing. It says they, they come together in the temple and then it says, and they're breaking bread from house to house. So it's, it's highlighting again this idea that the house to house, the small group idea is very important. And it says what's happening both in the temple and in the house. They were taking meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. Amen. Listen, I came across an article recently uh, from the Gospel Coalition. And the title of the article was How to Disciple Your Children to Drop Out of Church. That's right, I said that right. How to Disciple Your Children to Drop Out of Church. And many of you, maybe not all of you, have heard the statistics about children who grow up in church. They turn 18 and they don't come back. They're, they're now called Generation Z. They, they call them the nuns. And not N-U-N-S, N-O-N-E-S. The nuns, they have no religious affiliation. That's what they call themselves. That's what sociologists call them. And so this article is about how a parent can guarantee that their child will become a nun, N-O-N-E. That they will have no affiliation with the church. How to disciple your kid to not be involved in the church. So that definitely caught my attention. I've got three little kids. I'm like, okay, well, I, I definitely don't want to do that. I want my children to love the local church, so the corporate gathering. So what do I, I want to read this article. And here's what the article said. Six things, uh, excuse me, five things that you can do to make sure or to guarantee that your children will drop out of church. I'm only going to list four. Four. This is five. This is four. First, a guarantee for your children to drop out of church is this. Number one, attend church sporadically. 
Attend church sporadically. Here's what it says. If you treat church like an option, your children will too. If going to church is contingent only on there's nothing else going on, if sports or hobbies or vacations frequently take priority over gathering with God's people here, how could this not over time imprint itself on your kids? So the first way that you can guarantee that your, church, your kids will drop out of church one day is go to church only when it's convenient for you. Only when there's not a baseball tournament that weekend. Only when there's not anything else going on. Or it's going to rain at the lake this weekend. Well, I guess we'll go to church. You are discipling your children. Not only does your growth impacted by not gathering as a church, but the future of the church is impacted. The second way is to complain about your church. I don't like that they meet at this time. I don't like that they do this. I don't like that he wears that. I don't like this music. I don't like those people that come and do this. I don't like that they do this ministry and not that ministry. You do that long enough in your home and those ears, whether they be kids or teenagers, hear that. And you will guarantee that you are discipling them to drop out. The third way is to insulate them from the rest of the body. The article there goes on to explain, here's how you insulate them from the rest of the body. You bring them here and that's it. You're you're not connecting with a small group. You're you're not helping them or being a part of them connecting to the children's ministry, the preschool ministry, the student ministry. You're not integrating your life with those ministries. You're just bringing them, showing up, and then taking them back, not letting them interact. I hear people say, because here I am, I'm a young parent, okay? I hear young parents all the time say, I'll get involved in a small group or I'll get more involved in church when my kids get older. Are you kidding me? That is a lie from the very pit of hell. I I, I lead a D group, okay? And that D group meets at my house. And I do that intentionally. Why? Because when those men come together, and we've been doing it for the last year, when those men come together, my children will always come up into that room. My son specifically, my, my second son, he comes up into that room and we kind of mess around with him. What are you doing, Gray? What's going on, man? I hug him up and we talk for a while and he just sits there and he just listens to us. And then we pray together and a lot of times he's up there or he's, he knows that we're about to pray so he goes back down. But my, those guys stay down there in my living room and we talk before we go upstairs. My kids are all running around. Why do I do that? Because I want them to see me interacting with other godly men. I want godly men to be encouraging me and laughing with me. I want them to see what the church looks like. If you're sitting there saying, well, I'll get involved in a small group. My kids get older. You've missed it. You've missed your shot. You're showing them the rest of the body doesn't matter. You can show them how to be a Christ follower. How? With other Christ followers. You insulate them from the rest of the body. You insulate them from the corporate gathering or the small group and you are guaranteeing that they will drop out one day. Why? Because they don't feel connected. They don't feel like it matters to you. And why should it? If you're not a part of one. And then the last way, again, four out of the five were connected specifically to your, your activity with the local church gathering. But the fifth way or the fourth way is that you church hop. You just go to this church and that church and this church and that church. Oh, I don't like this church. They started changing. We're going to go to this church. Oh, I don't like that church. They're doing this. I'm going to go over here. Oh, I'm going to go over here. And that shows them there's no devotion. There's no commitment. Let me share something with you. I am a mess. Okay? I'm a mess. We are all messes. And if you get involved in a church, I've heard somebody say it like this. I don't want, I, if you find a perfect church, don't join it because you're going to mess it up. Oh, this is a perfect church. I love it. Then you better back out. Put it in reverse, Terry. Don't go to that church. I probably shouldn't have said that, but it's fine. Look, none of us, none of us are perfect. That's the whole idea. That we come together and, and we're messes and we frustrate each other and we make each other mad and one person will say something and we'll look at our spouse like, what? That happens. Life groups, corporate gatherings, they're messy. We are messy. But it's in the mess that you find the love and grace of Jesus. You may be like, well, I don't like messy. Well, praise God you're not Jesus. 
Because boy, he must have really loved a mess to come down here to save me. He must have really wanted to be a part of a really messy situation to drop down and say, I want them as my church, a bunch of messy people who don't have it together. Yes. Church gathering and small groups, they matter. They matter for your life spiritually. They matter for your children. But then there's a third level. It says here that, they're, that they had favor with all the people. That's not just a few people. That's the people in their entire surrounding community. And I'm going to invite the band back up as we bring all this together this morning. This means that this church was so loving and could cook such good food and prayed so hard and praised Jesus so consistently that the surrounding community, the people who were not Christ followers, they had favor with them. That means that they looked at them and said, I like those people. They're, they really do practice what they preach. They really do love each other. They really do care for each other. Would this community say that about us? Would they say that about you? And look at what happens. I'm going to bring this all together with verse 47. When somebody, when a church member, a, a, a born again follower of Jesus gets connected to a group of people in a small group, they get connected to a local church and they are devoted to it, committed to it, praising God, eating together, worshiping Christ, all of those things. When that happens, look how God responds. We should perk up right now when we hear this. God is not right here. There's no God moments here. This is all what the church is doing. This is not what God is doing, right? And obviously God is in the midst of all of it. But verse 47 shows God's response when you and I do this with each other. When you and I love each other, care for each other, commit to each other. Here's how God responds to it. Verse 47. And the Lord... The Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. When the church is the church, God's eyes see it and he says, Whoo! That's what I'm talking about. I'm going to add more to your number because you guys are doing it right. Listen, if we go through a season where we don't see somebody saved, we don't need to look out and say, Oh, they're just so lost. They're so this, they're so that. We need to look at us. And we need to ask, what are we doing wrong, Lord? Revive us and start with me. Have you ever thought about that? That you showing up here this morning, your commitment to your church, your commitment to your small group, it matters in the eyes of God as to whether or not people come to Jesus. And you may be like, I, I may, you may never personally see someone come to Christ, but the way that your life group loves each other, cares for each other, and prays for someone who's lost may be the catalyst that the Spirit uses to bring them here. He adds to their number when the church is the church. I wrote this down this week. When the church gathers, the church grows. So the question this morning is, do you want to grow spiritually? And do you want to grow this church? And if the answer is yes, then commit to a small group. A, 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 this moment here, stop coming sporadically. Stop just coming when you want to or just when it's convenient. And you will see God do amazing things in your life and in the lives that are coming after you. Let me share a quick story about a person whose life was changed because a small group of people met. There was a young teenage boy, grew up religious, knew the Bible, but he was lost. And he knew he was lost, he knew he didn't know Jesus, he knew that if he died he'd go to hell. And this young teenage boy, he was compelled to go to a church one Sunday morning. He lived in London. And in London, as many of us know, it's cold. And every now and then, there's some serious snow that happens over there. And so on one weekend, a massive snowstorm comes into this place. And it, and it, and it literally like shuts down the whole city. 
So the church that he was walking to was closed. No one was meeting. No one was there. And so as he was walking back, he heard the faint sound of people singing. And he knew that they were singing gospel songs, hymns. And so he goes to this church. And he walks through the door and he sees about 12 people. 11 people. All older than him. Knowing his age. No youth group. And he walks in the back and he sits down. The preacher himself could not make it. He was snowed in. So some elderly gentleman in the crowd stood up. And the young man talks about this moment later on where he says, this guy was not educated in the scriptures. He's just a normal guy. And he got his Bible open and he turned it to Isaiah 43. And this, this ordinary fella, just a regular old church member, stood up in front of 11 people. And he read Isaiah 45, verse, four, four, verse 22. Look unto me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. And when that young man heard that passage of scripture that he needed to be saved, and that he had to look no further than Jesus Christ, all the education, all the religious experiences, everything met in that moment. And in front of 11 people, that young teenage boy walked forward and gave his life to Jesus Christ. Yes. Yeah, we can celebrate that. That young man's name was Charles Haddon Spurgeon. If you don't know who that is, he is one of, if not the greatest preachers that the world has ever known apart from Christ. He preached to millions of people back in the 1800s. God did more in his life through 50 years. He died at 50. He did more in his life in 50 years than many will see in 50 lifetimes. He was known as the Prince of Preachers. And do you know why he got saved? He could have gotten saved walking down that snowy road. He could have gotten saved on his way back home from realizing his church wasn't meeting. But do you know where he got saved? Why he got saved? Because a small group of people were so committed to Jesus and so committed to each other that they fought a snowstorm, walked through the doors, and sang and preached the gospel. Charles Spurgeon got saved because a small group of people were committed. Some of you this morning, you, you are the Charles Spurgeon. You are the young man, young woman, person who needs to be saved, who needs to come to know Christ. Look unto me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. If you're here this morning and you know you don't know Christ and you need to be saved, then you come forward here in this moment of invitation just like Charles Spurgeon did and you be saved. Tell me, tell Pastor Breck, Pastor Chuck, I want to be saved. I want to know Christ. And He'll save you today. We'll walk you through it. We've got counselors set up. They'll talk you through it. Today can, you can be the day where you're saved. But if you're saved this morning, and we're going to end on this. If you're saved, you're baptized this morning. Join a group. And join the church. You want to grow in Christ? You want to experience more of Jesus? You want to have the life that He actually intended for you to have at the moment He saved you? Join a church. And join a group. And hang on. This is the Word of God. What are you going to do with it? Let's pray. Father, this is Your Word. This is Your example that You have given to us of how Your church is to be Your church. God, help us to be people that are devoted to Your Word, to fellowship with each other, to prayer, to praising you, to giving, and to seeing people come to know Jesus. Help us be your church. God, add to our number daily those who are being saved. Let it start today. Let it start right now. And Father, I pray that our church would be a praying church. God, do what you want to do right now for your glory and our good as we sing, you work.
In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Pastors are here.